In this video, you're going to learn how to design services in a very siloed environment, which is primarily focused on the short term. All the right ingredients to design great services, right? Well, here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Iran Narges. This is the Service Design Show, episode 118. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. And the guest in this episode is Iran Narges. Iran is a service designer at the city of San Francisco. And the reason why I'm so excited to have her on this episode is because we're going to explore what the role of service design is in local government. Iran has applied service design on very long-term and large-scale projects within uh, the city of San Francisco, but also on projects that require a very rapid response, like setting up a COVID test center. I think the lessons and stories you'll hear in this episode will resonate if you have to work in a very siloed environment where there is a really strong focus on delivering short term results, regardless if that's in a government setting or in any other organization. The conversations with people like Iran really show us what the skills are that you need next to learning the tools and methods to actually be an impactful service designer. And if you want more of that, make sure to subscribe to the channel because we bring a new video at least once a week that will help to level up your service design skills. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Iran and Arjes. Welcome to the show, Iran. Hi. Hi, Mark. How are you? Uh, good. And we were preparing our chat and um, you're based in, where are you? Yeah. I'm in San Francisco, California. And we're recording this the day after, I don't know, how should we call it? The, 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 the coup, the, the, what was it? Well, um, there's, there's some, some de discussion out there about what it actually was. Mm. Uh, the word insurrection keeps coming up. Yeah, uh, it's 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 insane. So it's um, just for the context of the people who are listening and watching this episode. Uh, yesterday, the Capitol was stormed, and we're recording this conversation in in that context, and we'll be um, coincidentally or maybe not uh, touching upon some topics that relate to to government. Uh, not some, but a lot. Uh, Iran, for the people who have no clue about who you are, what you do, could you give like a brief intro? Sure, uh, that'll be most everyone out there, I'm sure. Um, I am the lead service designer for San Francisco Digital Services. So I work for the city and county of San Francisco. San Francisco is both a city and a county, which happens occasionally. And um, my team in general is uh, a fairly young team. It's been around for about four years now, and we are tasked with delivering human-centered digital services for um, the residents of, of San Francisco, California. Um, this is mostly a digital team, so um, UX designers, content strategists, engineers, product managers. Um, there's There's usually been at least one service designer within digital services, even from the beginning. Um, I joined in 2019, and at that time I was the only service designer. Um, in 2020, I was able to hire a couple more service designers, so we're now a team of three. How did you end up uh, at the city and the county of San Francisco? Yeah. Uh, well, I've lived here for a very long time, since the late 90s, uh, but this is my first government job. Um, I never thought that I would work for the government because the early part of my career, the first 15 years, I was a graphic designer and art director in um, city city government. No, well, there's really no level of government that uh, you know that you associate with a, a great creative career, at least at that time. Um, I sort of more or less by accident became a service designer uh, starting that process of becoming service designer started in 2013 when I joined Adaptive Path and um, you know Adaptive Path always had uh, 
clients that paid the bills, but but also um, took on uh, clients for social impact. And I uh, continued to do that a little bit after we were acquired by Capital One. Um, you know, I, I like money, I like paying the bills, but I also really like doing work that makes me feel like I'm some kind of way making the world a better place. And so um, I had an increasing number of friends who were working in civic technology. That movement really uh, took off in the, in the 2000s during the Obama administration. And um, just through, through people, I was introduced to uh, Carrie Bishop who runs digital services. And um, she recruited me for a particular project and uh, that was a time when I was between full-time gigs and it was a very interesting project. And I, I was really excited about the opportunity to be in public service and mm. try to make, make service experiences better for, for residents. Mm. Uh, I, I know that uh, it's, it's interesting. There are some countries where service design is predominantly uh, uh, present in the public sector and while in other countries is primarily in the private uh, sector. So I don't think the US is one of the f countries where service design and the public sector are, are sort of um, uh, very known for. So I'm really curious to be hearing your experiences. Um, before we get into the uh, uh, nitty and gritty and the meaty stories, uh, I want to get to know you a little bit better by using a 60 second question rapid fire. Uh, so I'm going to ask you five questions and just answer them as quickly as you can. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. What's always in your fridge? Eggs. Eggs. Good. Uh, which book are you reading? Um, ooh, I can't remember the title. It's a mystery. I go through a lot of them and I get mm. them on my iPad from the library. Mm. What superpower would you like to have? Flight. Flight. Good. What did you want to become as a kid? An archaeologist. Mm. And finally, do you remember your first memory of service design? Yes, um, I had never heard of service design in, until um, I was talking to Adaptive Path about joining. I was recruited by a friend and she said, oh, you probably want to look up service design. At that time, Adaptive Path was was really um, known for UX. Adaptive Path was and probably will always be kind of synonymous with UX, but um, they had started incubating a small service design practice several years before. So um, I went and popped it into Google and didn't actually. <laughs> and not a lot of came up probably back then. <laughs> not a lot that really helped me get my head around what it mm. was. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've had some people from Adaptive Pad. They, uh, they definitely uh, uh, sort of made a mark in the, in the field. So it's good that, uh, that you're on. Uh, we'll be talking about um, service design in local government. And uh, when we were preparing our talk, what I especially found interesting, and I think something a lot of people will be able to relate to, are the challenges like doing service design in conditions where people have a short term focus, where you are maybe not set up for success, where, um, um, where the organization is siloed up. So I think, um, the examples in government can quite easily be translated to many other uh, situations. And for the people who are listening, I think your stories will be really recognizable. You um, already mentioned something about why you got into public services and, uh, and the government, but why is this important to you? Why do you feel service design needs to be in places like the San Francisco city and county? so many of the the problems with the way that people experience government services are related to kind of the core things that service design is equipped to take on um you know there there's so many organizational silos and and so many breakdowns and drop-offs and um on the upside it's an environment where you know mostly 
people really do want to be effective and, and serve the public. Um, there are people who are passionate and idealistic. There are people who are, you know, maybe less passionate and idealistic, but still, you know, want to do a good job. They, um, the, uh, the organizational siloing is a big contributor to um, bad service experiences and frustrating service experiences. And unfortunately, the, the diffuse organizational structure also can make it hard to get stuff done, get decisions made and, and make change. So mm -hmm. before we get into some examples of the work you did, um, maybe we can set the stage a little bit. Like what is it that we need to know, uh, to better understand the projects that we're going to talk about? Okay. Um, I was hired to work on, uh, I was actually hired to work on the permit center, which is a place for getting permits. Um, what kind that of, was, like, like uh, housing permits or what, what kind of permits? So the vision was uh, construction, business okay. and special events permits, yeah. um, but construction, right? So, um, and that's mostly building permitting. There's yeah. some other types of permitting and construction. Um, that's sort of legendarily complex and challenging all over the world, <laughs> actually. Uh, San Francisco is, is certainly far from the only place where it takes a long time to get a building permit and where the process is complicated. But um, San Francisco is right up there with the, with the uh, complexity and time-consuming mm. process. Um, so the city and county was building a new building and the entire second floor of that new building was envisioned as the permit center. Hmm. And we were to have our grand opening in August, 2020. So <laughs> then, then the world uh, changed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The permit center does exist and there, there are some limited public services being delivered there, but, um, yeah, and we didn't what, what's your it. role there? Because you were brought on in, uh, in the context of this. Our permit center. Yeah, um, you know, my my I was brought in to try and help the experience be good, basically. Mm. How so, was the How was the experience? So, what was the what was the trigger to actually start developing this? Well, um, I started with research. It's it's you know I think where most service designers would would try and ground their work. Um, there had been quite a lot of of uh, preparation and planning over the years, because we're talking about the construction of a new civic building. So, um, but we were, the project was starting to gear up. Uh, it, there was a permit center director and, you know, she was on her own for a few months and then she started hiring people, myself included. So I always looked at it uh, sort of big picture long-term, which is the overall, the overarching experience of permitting. And then at the at the level of the visit so what's the arc of the experience of coming into the to the place on sure. that day and yeah. so yeah yeah and there were there are so many different departments that are involved <laughs> with these processes so there was a lot of facilitation and and um co-creation and, and working group initiation and kind of identifying and prioritizing problems and some you know there was some in-depth qualitative research a whole lot of discovery with staff and then just sort of ad hoc uh, discovery with with um, applicants who came our way. So uh, um, like the research part that that sounds I, I hope that sounds familiar to the people who are listening. <clears throat> now I can imagine that when an organization is siloed, um, how do you how do you translate the ideas and the insights into um, actually a better service. So w when you make a service blueprint or a customer journey map and you sort of show uh, the fragmentation and you, you present uh, a vision of how the experience might be, uh, like how do you connect all those different people who have different ownership, different responsibilities? How, that, how did it go? That is very much still a work in progress. To I be can honest. imagine, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you can also imagine that one service designer does not, you know, do that by herself. Um, and it, that was that was something I grappled with as a as a team of one over the the year 
like year and a quarter mm -hmm. that I worked on the project before COVID hit and changed everything. Um, you know, I, I consoled myself and still do with all of the opportunities that I had to influence direction. Um, was not able to to conduct a service design process exactly the way it would have looked at, say, Adaptive Path with a team of four. Um, but I was also working every day with decision makers and leaders. And so um, I think one of the big wins for me was starting to introduce different concepts and different language like, that like were what? experience yeah, like, like what? Uh, well, so we we came up with kind of an experience vision statement for for the in-person experience um that it was really a synthesis of a, of a lot of stuff that we had learned and some some actual kind of competing needs that we learned about also so um the spectrum of people who try to access these services is is vast there are people who are just total experts in the system there are people who are experts in some stuff but have no idea about other bits and then there are people you know the amateurs you know i'm a homeowner i decide i want to do a small thing i'm like well i can do this myself i walk in and i have no idea what's happening to me so um so being able to to articulate a vision statement of uh that pulled in um Like the the mayor and some of the department heads had come up with a with a vision statement for the permit center. So we we intentionally pulled in language from that. Um, you know the big the big words were um, I think uh, what streamlined, efficient, friendly, right? Like these are it's not earth shaking. And, and then it became um, uh, a friendly guided experience for the novice, uh, a streamlined, efficient mm. path for for the expert so trying to balance these needs and and deliver and just i mean this sounds really basic and a lot of the stuff that that i did that we did sounds really basic but the the process is so oriented around a specific department experience and then sometimes it's like a specific group inside of a department and they're very siloed and and that is the the mindset and the orientation of most of the 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 staff and the the departments are thinking at that department level they're not thinking like oh we're going to deliver you a city experience um and so you know just saying over and over <laughs> we need to we need to have a, a connected experience and not make people navigate the individual departments like it doesn't sound radical but <laughs> <clears throat> I can imagine again, and this sounds so familiar uh, to to me. And again, I think a lot of people were, um, as a service designer, you sort of uh, are. I don't know. You, you're sort of in a really awkward place where uh, you see the opportunity, you see the vision, but you actually don't have the you usually don't have the execution power to align the different stakeholders, and and then. Like how how do you how do you move forward? How do you and I the the feeling that I'm getting is that you're just uh, just or maybe that's that's the strategy, like nudging people forward, like keeping reminding people. Um, like, is that the strategy? Do you feel if you're a team of one and this is the situation? Like, how do you actually make progress? Maybe <laughs> beyond the research well, because the research is is the thing that we're really good at, and I think. We can show the plans, but that still doesn't uh, necessarily instill action and implementation. Yeah. Well, you've nailed the most frustrating part of, of my job. And I think just being a service designer in general, yeah. um, you know, it, I was very lucky to be able to practice uh, in kind of consultant mode and learn the craft that way for a few years um, because you know, it is a, it is a much more um, tidy and rapid process and you get to a finished product. But of course, if you're doing say a three month engagement, the finished product that you deliver is probably not going to be like a robust mm -hmm. new or, or newly redesigned service experience. It's going to be more, more like strategy and at best pilot stuff. Right. So, um, I mean, that, that certainly was a consideration for me uh, in wanting to do this work is to be closer to delivery. And I am 
I'm inside of a digital services team, so they are delivering technology, um, you know, which is uh, which is valuable, right? Um, but the you know the the epiphany that I had uh, not being in consultant mode is like, oh, I this is this work is organizational. Like my work is about changing the organization, helping the organization change so that they can deliver a better service. And there's, it is, for, especially coming from a graphic design background where like graphic designers are the ultimate control freaks. You control everything. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of, that's always been a struggle um, when COVID hit. So before COVID I had been, working very closely. I was, I was embedded with the, the permit center team and I was doing a lot of work with the departments. Um, and so, you know, that gave me the opportunity to learn a lot about different groups and, and be up close with their work and, and interact with, um, with applicants of various kinds uh, from the, from the more professional to the, to the more, you know, amateur. Um, when, when COVID hit, um, you know, all of digital services went fully remote. So I've been working out of this studio every day since March. And um, the emphasis in in the permitting work really shifted r- rapidly from the place to how can we get some of these services online ASAP so we can stop staff and, and applicants from like contracting a deadly disease while they're trying to get these services. So um, I kind of came home <laughs> to to be much more embedded with digital services and like working shoulder to shoulder metaphorically, of course, um, with them to try and deliver, like really accelerate the the um, development of digital permitting for specifically for building permits. So the building permit process had been tremendously uh, paper based, like there, there is a system of record information goes in there. Like there's a website where you can go and, and see some stuff in the system, but you applied with paper. And if you had architectural plans, which most of these things do, you brought in big rolls of paper and that's, um, it, you know, there had been attempts to digitize that process going back years. And it, it's just, it's very complex. There's like, I won't even go into all the complexities and the challenges, but, um, when COVID hit, you know, the fact that it was a, an emergency and, a, and of such an unprecedented and unpredictable nature really forced uh, some dramatic rapid change. And um, well, I was thinking about it, like um, it, there isn't, maybe there is and maybe there isn't, but there isn't much change in sort of the backend process of the permitting uh, process when the interface is like a physical experience center compared to uh, a digital interface. Like the interface is different, but the on the back end, all those, all those departments still need to collaborate, cooperate, uh, make your process more efficient. So did you also notice a difference uh, there when COVID accelerated everything? Oh yeah. Um, so the only reason I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's the only reason I would say the main reason why the attempt was made to digitize that process is, um, the permit center team had been, uh, coordinating this process to adopt a, a digital plan review tool. And they'd had this whole long working group process that had plan reviewers from all the different departments. Um, there was a consultant that had helped people adopt this tool in the past. It, it like it went on for months and months and months and, and culminated with a few pilot projects uh, in March. And that was the first time that, uh, you know, that there was an official sort of digitally reviewed um, project. So they had done three projects. Mm. <laughs> and then, um, and so when, you know, when we went into this emergency digital mode, um, we took a few weeks to launch. Uh, we actually launched something that allowed you to do fillable PDFs within like a week or two. And then we, and then we had a digital native form up about four weeks after that. 
and it is a very long and complicated form. And that is not how we ever wanted to do this. I mean, our, our team was always like, no, we can't just take your form and put it online. Um, but, you know, under emergency conditions, we all made different choices. And so um, what happened was, well, <laughs> I'm not going to go into all the, the gory detail, but basically the the system was not ready to do that. There were certain pieces in place, but um, it, the translation of the in-person experience into a digital experience was not, co- it wasn't enough of a translation. It was like, a, it was actually like a really terrible machine translation where have you ever seen something where it's like the literal, like a literal meaning of each one of the words, but it's the wrong literal meaning and they're all in the wrong order. Um, yeah. So th- we learned uh, there was a lot of stuff about that interaction. Um, and there were a lot of things outside of the, the sort of artifacts that would happen. Like staff would really tease out a lot of other information and then they would have to, then they would have to shape that information so that they could feed it in the right way to the system. Um, and yeah. Do you feel that now in hindsight, the, this process could have gone any other way? Like maybe this was needed to get to the point where it is today as a, maybe this was just a research step. Oh, I don't know. There is no way that that we could have learned as much as we did yeah. um, in that in that kind of time. And there's probably things we never would have been able to learn at all. Just, um, but that was a very painful and costly way to to learn these things. So, but it was a quick I mean, way, <laughs> <laughs> right? It, compared, I can imagine compared to uh, um, uh, how long these processes might take otherwise. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's probably a fair statement. The the amount and the depth of knowledge that we gained through this experience, there, there's probably no other way we could have gotten that information in in months and not years. Um, but the the upshot of it is that uh, they had to dial back the the online process because the you know there were pieces in place that just there were pieces that were missing systemically to make it a really efficient process and um it, it just wasn't it was it a wasn't prototype. well basically it was a prototype right and and yeah. uh yeah so yeah. again looking back at this what would you say to somebody who's in a similar situation like a team of one in a really siloed organization uh where they have done the research they see sort of the vision everybody sort of sort of agrees that we need a, a overarching experience. We need a holistic experience. Um, how would you move forward as a service designer? What what would you advise to people in that situation? Well, I mean, I'm going to be brutally honest here, and this is advice that I've been giving people for a long time. Like, n- some situations are just doomed, and you should be honest with yourself if you're looking at the setup and and you're seeing you're not seeing a path forward, go find another job. Mm. Like don't put yourself through that. Um, which this is not, I'm not giving like my two weeks yeah, yeah, notice yeah. anybody yeah. in the moment, but, <laughs> but I feel like if anybody is watching this, especially someone who is struggling with, with the situation, especially someone younger mm. as a not younger person, let me tell you, you can just quit. Mm. <laughs> so that's my PSA. Um, but I'll, I'll like my real answer there is like, if you're not going to quit, uh, figure out how decisions get made, um, because as a team of one, as a service designer, like service designers, it's not our job to be making those those final decisions for organizations. Um, but what we can do is inform and influence and facilitate and kind of herd people along. Like if if the organization or organizations that you're working with actually want to do a thing um, and they're just having trouble kind of getting organized, you can help a lot by arming them with information. You can tell you can tell them the story. Uh, as designers, we have tools for for communicating and storytelling and and learning and synthesizing that mm. are are unique and valuable. Um, and you know the other thing is like 
there is no more more powerful storytelling mechanism than a pilot, something mm. that's actually working. Or not working. Uh, or not working. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. something that's real and tangible. It gives people something to respond to. That is the most powerful tool for bridging the, mm. you know, the the strategy with the execution. You, you have to be able to cross that gap because even if it seems like a narrow gap, it's like such a deep canyon that people don't want to fall into mm. between yeah. thinking and doing. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you recognize these uh these characteristics in your environment, like very siloed, many decision makers, diffuse decision making. Um, you just have to set your expectations that this is going to be a long ride. And and that's maybe the ultimate question that you need to ask yourself. Are you are you patient enough to to sit it out and to guide these people who probably want to be guided, but it will just take a lot of time and energy and Right. That's that's maybe just the nature of the work in some situations. Yeah. I mean, I don't. It, again, like I'm at a point in my life and my career where I understand that that any sort of real meaningful change is going to take years and not months. Um, and I think that goes double and triple in government where things do often tend to move slowly, although things don't move at a uniform speed. Like they're, they're pockets, right? The little rapids in the river where, where something is moving along uh, at a faster clip. Um, and so it's good to look for those opportunities. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with things taking a long time, yeah, but I need yeah. to feel some sense of progress. Hmm. So talking about things that move fast, uh, the COVID virus. Uh, you had you had some involvement in setting up the. Uh, it's not the vaccine center. It's the uh, what's the it? testing site. The testing facilities sites. Yeah. Testing sites. How Very are, little involvement, but I'm proud of. Tell, I'm proud tell of us it about anyway. it. Tell us about it. What does a service designer <laughs> contribute in uh, that kind of environment? Yeah, as is the case with so so much of what I've done here, like just basic, basic tools of service design um, can be really helpful. And it's that yeah. it's that holistic end to end view that we have that we bring to, yeah. to the party that maybe like, what, else what did has. you do? Don't marginalize it. Like, <laughs> well, I, you know, we were working with a lot of different groups who were all contributing a piece. And so facilitating a service blueprinting session where we actually went through the whole end to end experience, you know, and, and, you know, it, I made a Google Sheet, and it never made it beyond Google Sheet, but um, it was the the one thing that kind of tied together all the bits and pieces, and it helped us kind of think through like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm working with the digital team; they're building the technology right now to um, to start taking uh, uh, not application signups for testing, and so where's like where's the data going? Like, kind of tracking all the systems and all the actors and um, you know, and the groups that we were working with, they really had their act together and they had done a lot of the important work. And so they didn't need to have the whole thing service designed, but, um, but I was still able to, to come in and just, just help, uh, create that truly end to end view. Do you feel, uh, why do you feel that this, uh, worked at the pace it, it did? Like, why did this move so quickly? And um, wh why why were you able to add so much value in such a short amount of time compared to the uh, to the other to the work that has a different kind of nature? Um, well, it, so it's funny because both of these 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 uh, projects were happened under COVID emergency conditions. So there's sort of a level there, but um, with permitting, first of all, there's enormous inherent complexity mm. in, the, in the codes, right? So there are a lot of legal mandatories. Um, there are a lot of different bodies of code that can apply to a particular building permit application. Um, but another thing is they have legacy technology, right? Like that, that system of record that I talked about and the different departments have different systems. So when you're dealing with legacy systems like that, it it's a different world. Whereas with 
COVID, the, the actual thing is really simple. Um, you know, you're just providing some information and you're getting an appointment and, um, you know, they had a huge site, so it's drive through. So they had all, that all planned out. Um, we had a, a medical partner that does both uh, testing and also some technology development. So it, initially digital services built the front end. Um, so, you know, we just, we put up a site on our website. It doesn't take that long. We connected to a scheduling tool via APIs. It doesn't take that long. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, our testing partner actually took, took on the front end of that after, I don't know, a month or so. Um, so it, it was an emergency. We, so we had that time pressure. The, uh, technology was relatively simple and defined. We weren't dealing with legacy systems. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine that, uh, legacy and, um, legal stuff uh, just slows down everything. And I was making my notes here and I was also thinking like um, maybe a crisis makes sure that everybody is aligned on what we need to do and align on budgets. Uh, but if that would be the case, then we would always need a crisis to actually get stuff done quickly. Um, so I'm not sure you know, if that's if that's the case. Yeah, I mean, people were willing to um, in the in the early days of COVID. Like, people were moving fast. People were being very flexible and and open minded. Um, and you know, sometimes the sometimes that's not enough. Like, mm. you really have to uh, do. I mean. If I could do that, the whole, that part over again, what I would have wanted to do would be to have an, an actual end to end pilot and then like actually measure the whole thing. Like what is actually happening? How long is it taking? I think that would have given us um, the information we needed, but I think the, then in that case, the answer would have been, no, we can't do this. Hmm. <clears throat> when you, uh, hear people who are also involved in the project and uh you hear stories about your work and the thing that you contributed like you're mentioning i, I did just the basic service design stuff how do other people in the project perceive it like what was the value and how did they express that to you yeah i think the the biggest um compliment uh and maybe it shouldn't be, but I feel very flattered when people find my work useful. So mm -hmm. having engineers go and like refer to the to the spreadsheet and, you know, they're like tracking row by row. They're like, OK, what's happening here? You know, that's what they're the thing that they're referring to to kind of uh, get the information they need to make the decisions that they need to do the thing that they need to do. Like um, when engineers are, are kind of pouring over your blueprint. You know. And it helps them to make decisions, right? That's that's yeah. that's basically, and it helps them in the end to create something that it's more, uh, not more pleasant, more valuable, more. I mean, better and in, in in all senses, yeah. I and and also my team. Uh, now that I have a team, um, you know, we also work very closely with content strategists, and sometimes like. The, the COVID testing site was not the only thing that we had to stand up really rapidly. There were a lot of those kinds of projects and there still are um, where we have to stand up, a, you know, kind of a, a lightweight form and, and some sort of service front door. Um, it, and it's almost all around COVID. And so there was one case where um, the service designers had done this, uh, had done a service blueprint and, um, the content strategist was working on a million things, like it was all COVID related, everything was an emergency. And so she was able to just sort of look at the service blueprint and be like, oh, okay, here's what I need to do. Um, as opposed to having all that, to do all that discovery herself. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest lesson that you take away from, from this specific involvement? Um... You know, I'm just struck by the how useful the fundamentals 
are. <laughs> like, we we don't need the shiny shiny objects, right? Yeah, I mean, my my experience of of doing service design post COVID has really been around reinforcing the fundamentals. Um, like, you will always, always, always be more successful if you understand the end to end experience. Um, it is always, always important to understand the handoffs and the edges and the boundaries. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been uh, with the city of San Francisco now for one and a half year, right? Since two years. Two years. I think next week is my two year anniversary. Mm. If you look back on that uh, period, what has surprised you the most? COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, mm. like, I was a little obvious, but, um, you know, I think I'm surprised by like the, the ratio of time that I spend um, really doing very organizational and kind of bureaucratic things versus um, doing more designerly yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, I thought I would be doing, like, I don't spend that much of my time right now doing research, which is unfortunate because I love doing research. But, um, you know, I do spend a lot of time uh, in cross-functional working groups. And yeah. um, and then, you know, when COVID hit, I was able to, to bring the subject matter knowledge that I had to the digital team because they had not been marinating in that world full time for, for over a year. Um, and I also, like, I knew a lot of people. I had relationships from these cross-functional working groups. So when we had questions, um, if the, there were lots of things I couldn't answer, but I knew who to ask. And I guess uh, that's the kind of skills and the type of service design work that they don't teach you in service design schools or you don't learn in service design books. But it is a really big part of our work like it it's the ne it's the very next thing that comes after creating a customer journey map like working with other uh, departments uh, communicating uh, helping to make decisions and I think that's where uh, I wouldn't say where the real difference is made but that that's where you can sort of create a lot of leverage as a service designer I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, it, it's hard for like, I'm right. I'm really in the thick of it. And also I have a, a tendency to, to sort of discount my own work and my own contributions. Um, but, you know, I, I am like, I and my team, like we, we are right in the middle of a lot of stuff. And, um, and so we have to figure out um, how, like, how can we be of service? How can we help progress happen um, based on where we find ourselves? Do you, and the, the world is now changing literally uh, uh, every minute, but do, do you have any um, a vision for the next one or two years? Like, where do you hope to take service design within local government? What is your dream? We're a very young team. Um, you know, I, I as uh, the service designer who was part of digital services, when I was a team of one, I was really off in my own world with the, the permit center team. But um, post COVID and, and, you know, my, the, first service designer joined a month before shelter in place. And the second service designer um, joined actually in May. So several months after shelter in place. And so she's had a fully remote experience. Um, and given the, just the madness of all of our work was COVID related one way or another, everything was an emergency. Um, digital services itself is a fairly young team. And so we're a really young team within a fairly young team um, and we're kind of this this different function that didn't really exist as a function within. So we're we're still building our practice. We're still um, kind of uh, oh, and the other thing is none of us have worked in government before. <laughs> so 
we're we're doing a a lot of learning on the job. Um, my intention early on was to sort of uh, do more more thinking and and communicating about how I thought things might work. And it turns out, no time to do that in an emergency when things are flying at you thick and fast. But also, um, so we we have we don't have our process as well documented as I would like. But also some of the things that I that I thought we would sort of talk about and then try, we just did them, and and uh, so our colleagues sort of learned with us how we might work with them <laughs> in different situations. So um, my my big goal for one of my big goals for this year is to not be in emergency mode all the time, mm. right? Because a lot of the things that we do, ideally, we would have some longer lead times. Um, and, and, uh, and so like having a little more planning around our work so that we can get a running start on some activities, uh, you know, rather than trying to do everything simultaneously, like the strategy and the design and the execution, we're going to do it in a week. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and label that as a sprint. <laughs> no, no, we're done. <laughs> like, oh, okay. We have to deliver the thing in a week now. Yeah. Um, is there anything that we forgot to discuss in the last, what is it, 45 minutes? Ooh, um, wow. How, where has the time gone? Uh, hmm. I think we covered a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah. it, it turns out I have a lot of stuff to, to say about permitting. <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 an exemplary of a lot of uh, other projects and challenges in uh, in service design, I guess. Maybe yeah. uh, maybe uh, the question that I have for you is, um, if people want to exchange experiences and uh, uh, learn more about your work, service design in government, uh, what are good resources and can people reach out to you? And if so, which way? Oh, uh, yeah, people can definitely reach out to me. I, I try to be responsive on LinkedIn. Some, I mean, it, this has been a hard year for, <laughs> for that. Um, LinkedIn is a good way to, to find me. Digital Services has a website. Um, hmm. it's, it's funny, like we launched the city of San Francisco's new website, uh, sf.gov. Um, so more and more departments are coming onto that platform all the time. Our, our own site is like a, it's a microsite somewhere. So, but if you Google San Francisco digital services, you'll find it. Um, there is a blog on that, that site that um, has so far zero blog posts by yours truly because I've been <laughs> busy actually delivering <laughs> like, and designing well, services. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's moving up my personal goals list just because it's embarrassing. Yeah. We'll see. Well, well, I'm like sure to include all the links in the in the show notes. Um, I wish you uh, a lot of uh, wisdom in the coming weeks and months because I'm sure your work uh, isn't over uh, anytime soon with uh, what's happening here. Definitely not. Um, every day is, uh, you know, the. The situation remains dynamic, and um, there are dynamic. still a lot. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so who knows? And it, uh, in that sense, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time in your uh, busy schedule, helping uh, to improve the COVID situation and the city of San Francisco. Uh, sharing with us the challenges that you've been facing, uh, the solutions that you have found. So uh, I hope people have been inspired. So uh, thanks again. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation with Iran. And if you made it all the way to the end, make sure you leave a comment with the hashtag commitment. If you know somebody who might enjoy this conversation as well, just grab the link and share it with them. That way you'll help to grow the service design shop family and that helps me to invite more inspiring guests like you're on here on this show for you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.